What's up guys, welcome to the series about design patterns and how to implement them on AWS using only serverless services. Not impressed. Let's see if this makes this sound quality better. Please let me know in the comments. Event sourcing. And this one is super interesting pattern when used for the right use case. You don't want to use event sourcing for everything. And the same way you don't want to use microservices for everything. The same way you don't want to use NoSQL databases for everything. But there are use cases where this pattern is a must. Say we have a banking application that was built using a simple MVC pattern, model view controller. A customer starts with $100 in their bank account. That $100 is stored in a column called total amount, right? Now this customer withdraws $50, five zero. The controller then calculates the total amount minus 50, which equals 50. So it sends 50 to the model that does an update on the column and replaces 100 by 50. Now querying the database tells us the final amount, but it doesn't tell us how we got there. The customer might have withdrawn $20, then $30, or maybe they withdrawed 90, then deposited 70, then withdraw 30, but we don't know, right? We, we only recorded the final state. For some applications like banking, the final state is super important, but how we got there is equally important. In other words, every action needs to be recorded. And this is the trigger word. If you find yourself looking to design a solution for a, a, a problem where every action needs to be recorded, then I want you to start seriously considering event sourcing, which will bring many benefits. There are a few reasons why recording every action is highly beneficial. We talked about banking, but let's consider an application that receives frequent location updates from, uh, from its users, and, and this application records them. The most obvious benefit here is that we now have a log of all the changes. Not just can we see where each user is right now, we can also see where they have been. And you know, your, your data science team will love you for this. Another benefit is the ability to recover the whole state in, in case of a disaster. Say you lose your main database for whatever reason, well, you can still go through the event log, the, you know, the, the place where you decided to record all the actions, and you can completely rebuild your whole database up to the last action. And that's where uh, choosing the right tool to log your event is of the utmost importance. And we'll get to that uh, in the architecture diagram. The other big benefit that comes with the pattern is the ability to in case of an error or a, or a discrepancy, uh, the ability to go back in time, reverse an action, fix the error, then replay all the events that came after it. Another use case that sadly, I don't see a lot of people use it, but in my opinion is a must, is debugging. Imagine now you have a problem in a production server. Instead of debugging the problem in production, you'd be able to actually spin up an identical test environment and replay all the events one after the other until you reach that problematic state and that's it, debug away. Another great example I thought of as I was preparing this episode is Git. If you were wondering how you are able to roll back to a previous commit and uh, you know create a new branch from there and then cherry pick commits or, or any other operation, well, that's because Git and version control software in general, they use event sourcing. Okay, so the first thing you should consider is the required disk space because you're storing every change as an event with metadata, like who did the event, the, the event type, the timestamp, uh, and whatever you know other metadata you want to include. But in my opinion, uh, I believe this is a minor disadvantage. Disk storage is a commodity by now. Okay, I know I have touched already on multiple concepts and I know you're eager to go to the, to the, to the diagram, but we still need to talk about eventual consistency to close the loop. Eventual consistency is best explained with an example. 
your data is replicated on multiple servers. Your client can access any of those servers to retrieve the data. So now you have someone who writes a new piece of data to one of the servers, but it wasn't yet copied, you know, to, it wasn't yet re replicated to the, to the rest. And now you have another client accessing the server with the data and gets the utmost up-to-date copy, but you have a different client or even the same client access a different server, one which didn't get the new copy yet and it, he gets or she gets the old copy. Majority of applications tolerate eventual consistency very, very well because a majority of applications don't handle life or death situations, right? Sometimes you'll post something on Facebook and you'll see it disappearing for a short while before appearing back again. Sometimes you'll delete a picture from Twitter, but someone from a different continent might still be able to access it for a few seconds later. Granted, there might be caching and, and other stuff to it, but you get the idea. All right, so let's see how we can design a serverless event sourcing architecture that tolerates eventual consistency. Many organizations decide to split their application into several domains and have each domain assigned into a different team. Spotify, for example, is famous for its squad framework. So here we have the payment domain, which is a set of services maintained by payments team. Every time a payment goes through, the team decides to send an event through Amazon Kinesis data stream. This is a massively scalable and durable real-time data streaming service, which can continuously capture gigabytes of data per second from hundreds of thousands of sources. Also, it is serverless. So it perfectly fits our case. Now we have events coming in through Kinesis like this. Every event has a type, whether it's a deposit, a withdrawal or, or something else. User ID, who made the transaction, shipping address, payment information, you know, with the credit card number and timestamp. But once the event hits the stream, more information gets added to it. So it sort of end up looking like this. Now, we need to store this event somewhere. And an S3 bucket is a great event store. Another variation I see often is to use a DynamoDB table as an, uh, as an event store. They both have uh, their pros and cons, but I personally prefer S3 for many reasons. And you see here that I used another service called Amazon Kinesis Firehose in order to transport the events from Kinesis data stream to their final destination, the S3 bucket. And that's because Firehose is the easiest way to reliably load streaming data into uh, data lakes, data stores, analytics services. It is completely managed, you know, it's, it, it automatically scales to match the, the throughput of the data. Uh, it can batch, it can compress, it can transform, it can encrypt data before loading it to S3. And um, did I mention it is serverless? So with these three managed serverless services, we completed the first step, which is capturing all events and storing them into a data store that is designed to provide 99.99999 nines of durability. Now, we most likely don't wanna stop here. We need to process these events somehow and do something with them. And for this, Lambda function is the perfect consumer. Once you set up your Lambda function with a Kinesis data stream, Lambda invokes your function as soon as records are available in the stream. You don't have to do anything. Lambda is programmed to invoke the function as soon as events uh, uh, get into the stream. So you can have a Lambda A that reads all events and store them in a DynamoDB table. And that can be now your database. But your consumer doesn't have to be a Lambda function. It can be a container. It can also be an EC2 instance. But it's worth to note that Lambda does event source mapping natively. So it will automatically keep track of which messages have been processed and which are yet to be handled, which is a big advantage if you ask me. If you want your consumer to be something like, like a different Docker container or, or program running on an EC2 instance, you need to do this uh, management by yourself. You need to keep track somewhere, somewhere, somehow of how we, I mean, 
Kinesis provides a library uh, called the Kinesis Consumer Library, and you can find it on GitHub. I'll also link it in the description. So it makes this work a lot easier, but Lambda functions do it natively. So now the data is stored in a database for ease of access, but at the same time, a complete log of all transactions is also stored in a reliable S3 bucket. All right, now, you realize your data is useful to a different team or a different team, the fraud detection for this example, realizes that your data is useful to them. And you decide, you know, being in a good mood and everything to share it with them. So you can give them access to your team's S3 buckets so they can go there and pull it. But this bucket might have sensitive information, right? Especially in our example, it has credit card numbers uh, that you can't afford to share with everyone within the company. So how do you share data across the organization in a real-time fashion while keeping control of your data? And you probably guessed it, another consumer. This consumer will act as a, an anti-corruption layer. It will read the events, all the events, uh, exactly like our first Lambda does, but this one will strip all the sensitive data from it. And then it will push, it, push all these events into an SQS buffer where the fraud detection team has built their own Lambda producer. When you read from the Kinesis, it's a consumer. When you write to Kinesis, it's a producer. So this Lambda producer reads from the queue and pushes the events into their own Kinesis data stream in the, in the fraud detection's own Kinesis data stream. And the cycle continue. Uh, they might want to use Kinesis Firehose to store their own events into their own S3 buckets, you know, that they govern. They might have their own consumers reading these events and storing them in different tables. If we had chosen to follow a strict consistency, storing everything in an ACID compliant database, we would have first of all, introduced single points of failure. We, would have, we wouldn't have been able to actually implement strict data governance. Everyone would have access to that database and, and to those rows, and then we would have to start finding shortcuts and workarounds, like uh, giving permission to different users to access that database and then trying to find some role-based permission in the database. We, we don't want to get to that. Um, we also wouldn't have been able to separate these domains effectively and give different teams the luxury to choose their own tools because the payment team here might choose to build their Lambda functions in Node.js, in JavaScript, but the fraud detection team might choose Python and everyone works in parallel, but the data is shared in a, in a way that makes this all possible. And this is but the beginning. See, building an event-driven architecture like this offers more opportunities in terms of resiliency and high availability. But, and there's always a but, as I've said in the previous episode, don't copy and paste the architecture as is and expect it to work. There, is, there are a few pitfalls you have to be aware of when you build an event sourcing architecture with Kinesis and Lambda. And I'll be making a special episode to cover these. So just a quick reminder to subscribe for it. But before moving into the next pattern, let's verify the claims that we made uh, at the benefits section at the beginning. Do we have an event log? Absolutely with Kinesis data stream adding all sorts of metadata, like the region, like the timestamp, like the sequence number, uh, and with Kinesis Firehose converting every event into a JSON file and storing it into a reliable, secure, and highly available S3 bucket, we have our event log. Second claim, can we completely rebuild our system in case of a disaster? Again, 100%. We can start from a clean slate and completely rebuild the application state from events in the S3 bucket. We can have a playback Lambda that can be triggered manually to read all the events or a subset of these events uh, from the events bucket and then send them to the Kinesis playback stream. And the reason we don't want the playback Lambda to write directly to the data store is uh, uh, you later you know, uh, can attach additional subscribers to the Kinesis playback stream uh, as your application needs evolve. It might take time uh, for 
the events to propagate to all actors and be consistent across the domain. And realistically, unless you build in a, you know, a, as I mentioned, a medical application or um, a military system, something that deals with life or death situations, your application most probably can trade a couple of seconds delay. Um, you might trade that for the benefits that eventual consistency provides. So this was but an introduction. We didn't touch on other concepts like CQRS, for example, but I will probably use this design as a base and I will build on it in future episodes and I will keep adding some more concepts to it. And yeah, feel free to drop comments if you want me to clarify something, uh, if you think I should do things differently, um, if you don't agree with something I said, I'm active in the comments and I actually try to answer as many as I can per day. That was it guys for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new from it. If you did, don't forget to give it a like and please let me know in the comments what patterns would you like me to cover next. Till next time.